little Bible class this morning. Um, as we commence, uh, let us call upon the Lord in prayer, please. Our merciful and loving and kind and glorious Heavenly Father, in the name of thy Son, our victorious Savior, we call upon thee and give thee thanks for gathering us into thy house this morning upon thy day. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of God. And we thank thee, Lord, that we're here in thy presence. And we pray, Lord, that thou wilt help us this morning to worship thee in spirit and in truth, according to thy word, that we may understand a little more of thine own revealed word and will, that we may come before thee and be uh, challenged, convicted, changed. O oh Lord, we do pray, forgive our sins, which are many. Forgive, O oh God, also the power of the flesh and the weakness of the spirit, of our spirit. And Lord, we do pray that thou will help us to mortify the deeds of the flesh, to put off the old man and to put on the new man which is made after the image of God in Christ. Lord, we do pray, help us this morning. Open thou our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. For we pray this, our God, at the throne of grace, in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you open up your Bibles to Psalm 16 this morning, please? Psalm 16. Welcome to those who are fashionably late. Uh, we're opening up Psalm 16 um, as we will examine questions 49 and 50 of the Shorter Catechism. So Psalm 16, and we'll read together just the first uh, six verses. Psalm 16 says this, Psalm 16 is a miktam, a, a teaching of David. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent, in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied, multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. Amen. Amen. And so in this adult Bible class this morning, uh, we're still continuing working our way through uh, the Shorter Catechism. And so the uh, questions 49 and 50. And essentially that's, uh, we're com now coming to the Second Commandment to understand what the Second Commandment teaches. Now there are a number of questions that go forth from this. Um, uh, questions 51 and 52 will then sort of open up more of the depth of it. But question 49 just simply asks, which is the second commandment? And then the answer is the second commandment, which we will hear. The second commandment is, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. 
The following question, question 50, then poses this question and answers it. What is required in the second commandment? And very simply, the answer is the second commandment requireth the receiving, observing, and keeping pure and entire all such religious worship and ordinances as God hath appointed in his word. So the answer there is the second commandment requires the receiving, observing, and keeping pure and entire all such religious worship and ordinances as God hath appointed in his word. And Colossians 51 and 52 will open up the second commandment more that we may understand uh, that the moral command of worship, which is essentially what the second commandment says. So as we consider this, I have a question for you. When is a commandment not a commandment? Sounds a bit obscure. When is a commandment not a commandment? Well, when you hide it, and then you get nine. But to make it up to ten again, what do you have to do? Well, you have to get another commandment and split it up and make ten out of it. And that's exactly what the Roman Catholic Church did. The Roman Catholic Church confronted with this commandment, which they still have in their Bibles, in the, their Latin versions and in their translations. It's still in Exodus 20. They haven't got rid of those verses. But they just, when they, when they, when they publish it, when they print it, when they paint it, when they have it carved, uh, or anything like that, it, it suddenly disappears. And, and, and their, their reasoning is, well, it, it's part of the second commandment, it's part of the first commandment, so we don't have to, we don't have to mention it. But of course, there's, there's, a, there's a guilty conscience prick here, because if anyone who worships God through images, it's the Roman Catholic Church. So it's not removed from the scriptures, but every time that they talk about it in their catechism, it would, it would suddenly, you have the first commandment, and there's a third commandment, which they call the second commandment. And then to make up for it, and we'll see it when we get there, the tenth commandment is split into two. So you have two commandments about coveting. So it doesn't even make logical or theological sense. And never mind, it's directly against the scriptures. And of course, they must do that to hide from the people what the scriptures say. If they had the second commandment very clearly, even in a shortened form, you know, that, 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 that um, um, uh, sort of, the brain is a bit tired. Second commandment. Yeah, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And then they'd have the statue of Mary, the statue of Peter, the statue of Christ on the, crucif on the cross, and, and all these other statues that are told to adore, obey, venerate, or any other theological uh, play on words just to say that you're not worshipping a piece of wood or stone. And then the people would start thinking, hang on, this can't be right. Because if that happened, it might lead to reformation. And so it did in 1517. So that's what they do. They're hiding from the people what the Lord has commanded against impure and idolatrous worship. Because the right worship of the right God is the natural result or the natural commandment step after the first commandment. But the first commandment is made very clear. There is no other God besides Jehovah, and he is therefore the one to be worshipped. There's no other God. And so therefore, we now understand who the right God is, and now we're beginning to understand the right way of worshipping the right God. And there are a number of matters that are raised uh, in this commandment, and we're just briefly looking at these that we've seen in the question and answer Today, um, question uh, 49 and, and 50, just remind ourselves what is required in the second commandment. The next question is what's forbidden. And then the third question that would open up the second commandment is what are the reasons annexed to it? There's a, a whole reasoning given to the second uh, commandment here as there is in uh, a number of those first table commandments. So what is required in the second commandment? We'll repeat that again. The second commandment requires the receiving, observing, and keeping pure and entire all such religious worship and ordinances as God hath appointed in his word. And let's, let's begin then by considering divine appointment. Divine uh, appointment, because that's the, the second part of the answer. So we're starting our examination at the second half 
to understand uh, that which is to be received, observed, and kept pure and entire. Well, what is that? Well, it is divinely inspired and revealed worship of God, nothing else. All, all his worship and ordinances, it's, it's, it's actually split up in two here, uh, the religious worship and religious ordinances. And, and that is, of course, absolutely in opposition to all human inventions. To all human inventions. Now, if you remember that when um, uh, Calvin was speaking of the human heart, he, he called it a perpetual idol factory. So within the human heart, in the flesh of man, at his very core, he is an idolater. He turned from Jehovah to Satan in the garden, turned to himself and to sin, and is a, is a constant idolater, which is why the, uh, the, the, the world is, is full of false gods and false religions, whether they be atheistic, uh, philosophical, or actually what we would consider religious. It's all idolatrous. It, it's at least a denying. But it really puts the worship of man's reason or, or man's abilities um, or demon worship, as, as, the, as Paul the Apostle reveals, what is behind false religion? Well, there's a demonic aspect to it as well as it being a lie. Now, God is, as we see, he's very jealous of his worship. The word is used in the second commandment. Of course, if we think of jealous, then we might think very quickly because we are sinful humans, and we might think that's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. This is a holy jealousy. This is a holy desire. This is the same holy desire that we see in the Lord Jesus Christ at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of the ministry as he goes into the temple and clears it. Now this, you know, so say of the Lord, this is a house, this shall be a house of prayer, but ye have made it into a den of thieves. It was a zealous, and the words zealous and jealous are actually uh, originally actually from the same root. And this is the idea that, 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 that how dare you do that? It's, it's, it's like somebody, if you're a child and, uh, and somebody comes up and, 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 and hits your mum or something, then you have a, a zealousness to how dare you do that? And if you've got any, and if you've got any sort of life in you you'd, you, you know, you'd start kicking whoever it is as a child. I mean. So there is a zealous, zealousness, a, a jealousness, a jealousy for the for, for, the, for, for the purity of God's worship. But we see that in God himself because God alone knows who he is. He knows his worth. And of course, he's not arrogant with it as we are. And we think, I have status. And, and then the pride gets filled. And, but God is not like that. God reveals himself in, the, in his son, Jesus Christ. Um, yes, as being a righteous judge, but also at heart being meek and lowly. So the, but the Lord knows the truth. The truth is, He is eternal and infinitely wonderful and ever blessed and ever glorious. And He has made the creatures and, and He's made them to worship Him because that is the most natural thing that creatures do when they have a glimpse of who God is. The only thing they can do is just worship His goodness and His mercy and His kindness and His grace. And so God's jealous of that because He knows what He's worth and He knows what He's created us for. And he knows it far better than we do, which is why he reveals it so often throughout his word. So if we have those two points that are mentioned at the second part of that answer. So religious worship and religious ordinances. Well, let's just quickly understand what they are briefly. We can merely skim the surface here, of course. Because really and truly, when we would consider the worship of God, we'd go... We'd have to go all the way back to Genesis 1 verse 1 to understand who this God is. Or this God is the creator. And, and, and to see how he, um, how we have sinned against him, and how, how how much we are to come to him in the worship of repentance, that repentance and humility towards this God is also an act of worship, as well as the different forms of worship the Lord has set up, and we'll look at that very briefly now. <coughs> so I'm essentially I'm saying 66 books of of solid study to understand who this God is we are to worship, and how he at different times has demanded he would be worshipped so that we would fulfill our humanity in truth. So religious worship is that reverence, that adoration, that, that glorying in the gracious and infinitely perfect God. And when we worship God, what we're doing, we're professing something of who he is. If you consider the, 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 the doxologies that are sprinkled throughout the New Testament uh, that we see, 
um, that we give him, you know, all, all, all glory and honor and power and might be thine forever and ever. That sort of considering hi- who he is, it's a worshiping, it's a profession uh, that we are subject to him, that he is our God and we are the creators. Also that he is our redeemer and we are the redeemed. It's also uh, s- declaring that we trust in him. How often is that in the Psalms? O oh Lord, I trust in thee. And we give him thanks. Thanksgiving, of course, is an important part of worship, as we've already seen in Ephesians 5. Giving to him thanks because he has given us life and he supplies all our needs, physical and spiritual. And we give him the praise and the glory that's due to him. He is our chief good. He is our only happiness. He is our savior. Psalm 95, verses 6 to 7 uh, gives us an idea of, of this worship is, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down this attitude. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. So we have uh, what religious worship is. So it's worship from the creature to the creator, from the redeemed to the redeemer. But then it mentions something about religious ordinances. Well, that's really the contents, the contents of that worship. The Lord's very clear. The contents of his worship. The Lord has always been clear. He has said uh, in his worship in the Old Testament, for example, that only those of the tribe of Levi who are male and above the age of 25 and are cleaned according to the law, pure, um, may worship me, may lead the worship, may perform help the high priest with sacrifices. Very clear. Nothing else was allowed because the Lord, he chooses. And then he picks one family out of the tribe of Levi, and that is the family of Aaron. And only Aaron's family, who are male, who are over the age of 25, may serve as high priests or assisting the high priest. Only them, no one else. And when Jeroboam um, there, uh, after the splitting of the kingdom, set up that, reli- that, that false version. Well, well, the Lord was very clear. Uh, we looked at this a number of weeks ago now. Uh, the Lord was very clear that he was very displeased. And even though he sort of made a copy of the temple and sort of brought in a, a copy of the priests, but they weren't Levites, they certainly were of the house of Aaron, and a sort of coffee, copy of the feast of, uh, I think it might have been the Feast of Trumpets, he just put it in a different month, The Lord was so displeased because the Lord is jealous of his worship. So anyway, let's just consider very briefly what the religious ordinances are, what the contents of worship according to God's word. No, this this could be a, a long study, and God's will it will be, as we intend to look at these matters in more depth in the near future, as the Lord is pleased to grant. Um, but the Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 21, which is all about church, the worship, and the, and the keeping of the Sabbath, <coughs> the Christian Sabbath, it says this in chapter 21 and verse 5, and so it's, it sums it up nicely. They've done the work for us. It says the reading, so the contents of religious worship are the reading of the scriptures with godly fear. So not, no mocking of the reading, uh, whatever, but the reading of the scriptures with godly fear. The sound preaching... So that's from the pulpit, and conscionable hearing, that's from the pew, of the word. In obedience unto God, with understanding, faith and reverence, singing of psalms with grace in the heart, as also the due, that is the correct administration and worthy receiving of the sacraments instituted by Christ. Of course, there are only two in the New Testament, baptism and the Lord's table. Are all parts of the ordinary religious worship of God, Beside, and then he goes in, then the, the, the framers of the confession go into a, a number of others, which are also included in the, in the scriptures, even of the New Testament. Religious oaths, vows, solemn fastings, and thanksgivings upon special occasions, which are in their several times and seasons to be used in a holy and religious manner. So clearly then, God's worship, uh, God's Ordinances of his, his worship are revealed in his word and they revolve around his word. So we have the, re- we have very, if we just bring it very, very we, we, we sum it up even 
tighter than we've just read uh, from the confession. It's the reading of God's word, it's the preaching of God's word, it's the singing of God's word, and it's the doing of whatever God has commanded in his word, which includes the first three. And as it concerns the word of God, what do we understand about the principle concerning the word of God? And, and a principle which, when carried out, has a com an effect on all sorts of things. Well, that there is nothing to be added or removed. Nothing is to be added, nothing is to be removed. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2 says these, these words, You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And that's something which is very much emphasized in our last point today, so we'll come back to examine that. So we've had divine appointment. Secondly, we have an humble acceptance, a humble acceptance. It says in the, the answer to question 50, the second commandment requireth the receiving, the receiving all such religious worship and ordinances as God hath appointed in his word. So the first thing we have is receiving, we'll then have observing, and then keeping pure is the final point. But the receiving, what, what does that mean, the receiving? It doesn't just mean somebody gives you a copy of the Bible and you've received it. Because you haven't heard it, you haven't studied it, and you haven't, understand, uh, you, haven't under, um, you haven't read it, studied it, or understood it. And so that's really what, 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 what receiving means. It, it means that whatever and however God has determined his worship is to be, at whatever phase of life in the church, and we know the church has had many phases all the way from Eden to the present day, that his people are to carry it out and we are to understand it. Uh, and so that receiving it is acceptance. That's what that word receiving means, accept it. But you can't accept it if you don't know it. And so if you're ignorant and, uh, of God's desire for worship, uh, then you can never carry it out, of course. That, that's, that's obvious. If you know nothing about the head covering, uh, then you cannot obey that commandment in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, if, you, if you know nothing uh, about uh, that sacrifices were fulfilled on the cross, so you don't need to sacrifice animals anymore. Uh, New Testament worship is bloodless because of what Christ did on the cross. So even the sacraments are bloodless. So whether they were, they were bloody sacrifice, uh, sacraments in the Old Testament, so circumcision was a, was, was a, 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 a bloody sacrament to bring someone into fellowship in the church and the Lord's, um, the Passover was a, a bloody sacrament uh, pointing to the atoning work of Christ. Of course, when Christ has shed the actual blood, his blood, holy blood, the real atoning blood, the sacraments suddenly become bloodless. Baptism is now with water. The, 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 um, Passover, it becomes the Lord's table uh, where we have the bread and the wine. No actual flesh of a lamb, no actual blood of the lamb. And so they become, so there's a change. We can understand there's a change. There's much more to be said, but that's just, that's a very, I think a very obvious one. Going from the law of Moses into the New Testament, and even the law of Moses is split up into two. So whatever, whatever phase of, of life in the church, and we know that Paul was talking about the church in its infancy, that the church was infancy, it had all these helps, it needed these helps and these images, but the church came to adulthood in the New Testament. So we don't no longer need those, 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 those things that a child would need to help it, uh, maybe to begin with sort of a pram to push it, or um, maybe you don't even call it a pram. But anyway, the thing that the child goes into when it's small and you push it along. Um, and it doesn't need these, these extra helps to learn to grip and to hold things and to discern and hand-eye coordination and all these things. And when it's gradually grow up, I mean, I trust that when we've grown up, we do not need rattles anymore. And we do not need big letters and big crayons to draw with because we've, we've grown up, we've matured, we've, we're, we're able to do these things much better. And of course, the maturity of the church is the ministry, the life and the death of Christ. So all these helps, all these things for the childhood of the church are no longer needed because, because Christ has come. And now the bride is ready to meet Christ and to be married to him, that is, the church. So 
So we just very, very briefly just run through the 66 books. We just think of this. Before Moses, personal sacrifice was permitted. We see that. We, 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 see, we see, well, Cain and Abel, we see doing it. We understand that they learnt it from their father and mother, so Adam doubt, doubtless did it as well. Certainly, uh, after the fall, the Lord slaughtered animals to cover them with their bloodied skins, an act of atonement, and they received it. Uh, so we see all through that time, Noah, uh, Abraham, um, different times uh, that uh, personal sacrifices uh, were made, and that was, and that was permitted. So personal sacrifice before Moses. And then we have Moses and the revelation to God's people of God's law. And, and, and then it's completely different. Then personal sacrifices are forbidden. Then it's forbidden. Because sacrifices are only to be done, as we've already mentioned, by the Levitical priesthood. And specifically by the family of Aaron. So then it's Levitical sacrifices. And it's in the tabernacle. So we have the tabernacle. But the tabernacle does not say everything about the law of Moses. Well, it does, about the law of Moses, but we see later on when the t temple comes that then there's a third period, uh, the temple worship. And that, again, has sacrifices, and only in the temple, but then we have musical instruments. We have musical instruments, we have the psalms sung at the same time as the sacrifice, which was the point of it. Specific instruments, five types of instruments, not any old instruments, but five type of instruments, or five instruments, and the singing, again, by the Levitical priests only. And, and we know that this is from the Lord. This wasn't the, the, the this, we know that Solomon received this commands from David, but the Bible reveals it was David, it was Gad the seer, and it was Nathan the prophet who had received this from the Lord, because this was a, a new thing, but it was a divine thing, and then it's a good thing. And so this was added. And then we have New Testament worship, which no longer has the elements from the tabernacle uh, or from the temple, as we see in the New Testament. Although what we do see in the New Testament are the elements that were always in synagogue worship. And I think the oldest reference we have to the synagogue worship would be from a psalm of Asaph. And Asaph talks about, Lord, they have destroyed thy synagogues. So from 1000 BC or so, just, just after the time of David, how long they had been going on, probably since the settling of the land, where the local Levitical priests would be there to teach the people. But again, there was no sacrifice except in the temple or the tabernacles. They were not places of sacrifice. Funnily enough, we mentioned this on Friday in the Young Adults Fellowship. So there are many elements, there are certain elements, purified elements, because so many things have been fulfilled in Christ. So anyway, coming out of that, so we can see there are certain periods that God has, ha, has given and it will, it, it will require more study for us to understand that, and God willing, we will. But if we're ignorant of what God wills us to, to give him, then, 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 then we cannot receive it, we cannot understand it. We cannot even desire to do it if we don't know. And then if we don't follow God's will in worship, then we're, we're not doing what he wants, we're doing what we prefer. And, 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 and sinful human preference is not the best way to approach God. We know David. David had his, desire, had his ideas. He, had his, he preferred moving the Ark of the Covenant from uh, that house to... Um, to Silo, where the tabernacle was at the time, he preferred to put it on a, on a beautiful, brand new uh, cart uh, 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 drawn by, by young, fresh, uh, unyoked oxen. The best of the best. He thought, I am going to get the best Porsche SUV I can buy, brand new, straight from the showroom, because that's really going to show how much I honor God. And then the car to the oxen, they're moving on the road. Even though the Lord had commanded very clearly that any time that the ark is to be moved, Levitical priests are personally to carry it on the poles. Nothing else. The poles will be to split into the rings and the, these priests are to carry it. And this 
wonderful reasons why, but we're not going into that now. But that was the Lord's clear command. David knew that. But David had another preference. Either David thought, well, it's going to take ages to get there. And I want it there as soon as possible. In his zeal, and he was a zealous believer, in his zeal maybe he thought, well, God won't mind. Well, God did mind. God, God did mind. Because not only was there no Levitical priests there to carry it and to guard it, not only was it being carried in a way that dishonored God and did not honor him, it then, the oxen stumbled, the cart stumbled, and, and the ark was about to tip off. And then one of David's men called uh, Uzziah, he reached out his hand to, to stabilize. Again, again, this practicality of, I know it's a holy object, I know no one can touch this except the Levitical priest, but pragmatism says, well, if I just stop it, then it won't get damaged. It should never have been on the cart in the first place. It should have never been drawn by beasts. It was to be carried by ordained men. Beasts have got nothing to do with the work of atonement in that way have nothing to do with the covenant law of God which is contained therein. And so God struck him down. What does that tell us? That tells us that God understands how holy and pure his worship is far more than David, a man after God's own heart did. And I think very few of us can even lay a claim to be even close to him in piety and worship. So our own personal preference have got nothing to do with God as commanded. Unless our personal preferen preferences become according to what God has commanded. When speaking of personal preferences, human preferences, which are not of God's preferences, Paul describes that in Colossians 2 and 23 and uses a word which is, which is a, th a phrase which is something that is, would ex desire more examination and, and at least one sermon in and of itself. He says, Colossians 2 and 23, he says, which things, and there's a whole litany of things, he's talking about false worship, have indeed a show of wisdom the appearance of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So he's talking about, he's talking about unbiblical fastings, unbiblical uh, worship in, in all sorts of ways. And he says it appears like wisdom. It appears like humility. It appears like the neglecting of the body. Oh, yes, I, I'm, I'm fasting. I'm doing this. I'm not doing that. But it's will worship. It's the worship of the human will, what the human desires are. But Paul rebukes it by the authority and the inspiration of the Holy Ghost in the New Testament. So whose will do we worship, God's or our own? And I think if the Lord is pleased to grant us that grace, and I, I, I think we might actually be quite ashamed how much of our worship is not God's but is our own. And so therefore the principle here is that any element of worship that's not commanded by God is what? It's declared to be unpleasing to God, but it's declared to be this in the second commandment, a form of idolatry. And the more you let that sink in, that's, I, I, that, that goes deep. And of course we understand that idolatry is unacceptable to God. So divine appointment we've seen, humble acceptation, and thirdly, faithful participation, which is seen in the word observing. So the second commandment requireth, well, we've seen the receiving. Now the observing of all such religious worship and ordinances as God hath appointed in his word. So that's observing. What does that mean? Well, well, first of all, uh, we've already seen the receiving. We, we, we've, 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 we've searched. We've studied, we've understood what God wants, but do we keep it as an academic thing? Do we keep it as some theological uh, subsection? Do we, do we keep it as some sort of pride of knowledge of the Bible? Are we going to be hearers only, but shouldn't we be doers also? And, and that's hero as well. That's the more 
the more you read the Bible, the more you see that again and again. It's not just listen, but do. And this is it. So we've listened, we've heard, we've understood. And now the Lord says, well, we'll do it then. That's the natural step. And so having understood from the Scriptures what type of worship is acceptable now in the church, what God would have and pleases Him, and therefore gives me the opportunity to give Him the purest worship and to give Him as much honor as pleases Him, that I'm not coming in here with a statue and saying, Lord, you know, this is a statue. It may look like Thee, and, 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 and therefore I'm going to worship it. And God says, I hate worship by images. You cannot have the eternal, infinite gracious, glorious spirit in a piece of wood. He hates it because it is a lie. He is not a creature. He is not this wide and this tall. We steal his honor. We steal his glory. And so you cannot bring it in. So once we've understood from him the worship that he desires, the worship that he pleases them when they actually have to do it. Once we've understood it, we must do it. And that's glorious. That's glorious. That we're convicted by his word to reform his worship according to his word, because then we can do what Christ said to the woman of Samaria at the well. And we often we use that expression and, and in prayer, and we mean it from our heart, to worship him in spirit and in truth. But it's only then that we can truly worship him in spirit and in truth. The truth of how he wants to be worshipped. And this is what the reformers had to deal with. The reformers, who were, you know, good Roman Catholic men, they did the dangerous thing of starting to read the Bible and then believing it. Well, then they were soon kicked out of the Roman church. But they saw very clearly that the, these, the, 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 these, these, um, uh, these ceremonies that these, uh, these choirs, that the, the, these use of, of, uh, of all these masses that were said, uh, and some of the words were taken from the scriptures and other words were just, just added. They could just see this is all, this is what, to use the phrase, pomp and circumstance. It was all show and, and theater is what Rome is very good at. It must be because there's very little content. And if there is good content, it's certainly not fully believed because they may receive it, but they haven't observed it. And so they realize that God is a spirit and he must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Which is what the Lord says by his own lips. I'll give you the full quote from John 4.23. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. So instead of us just having a, a, a sort of a, a shallow feeling from, yeah, yeah I, I, I feel I want to worship God, and, and if I am born again, then I'm doing it in spirit, and, and, and I mean it when I'm saying it, regardless of what I say or how I say it, and therefore that's the truth. That's not what the Lord says about his worship. It's how he wants to be worshipped, and he knows better. He, he understands it. You know, you could, you could go into the examples of, you know, you get a complicated piece of equipment, and, and the builder of that equipment gives a, gives a, gives a, gives a manual how to use it, instruction manual and, 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 and uh, uh, maintenance manual, and, and all these, and, and you know, heavy thing, and someone looks at all of that and he thinks, oh, that's too much work. I'll just instinctively figure it out. Yeah. And we, we know, and it's not just men who are guilty of that. <laughs> just put the manual to one side and, we'll, oh, I'll figure it out. Because I know women that do that as well. And you just put it to one side. You think you know better. But there are so many things that you don't know. You haven't turned on that circuit. You haven't, you haven't opened up this valve. You haven't done all this before you even to turn the machine on. You haven't done all those things that you should do. And so you start doing it. It seems to work. It seems to lumble. Uh, uh, it seems to do something. And that you notice it's, it's not coming out. Whatever the product is or whatever it's supposed to do, it's not quite working well. But, oh, it's close enough and you're all right with it. Until it blows up two years later because it just doesn't work and it costs more. But, you know, we have a manual that's about that thick as well. 
And I think it's important that we spend that time to understand what it is. And we say, well, the outward form I'm happy with. Who said it's anything to do with you? Is God happy with it? That's a challenge. Divine appointment, humble acceptation, faithful participation, and finally zealous preserving. We'll run through this. God willing. So what's he saying then? I, I, zealous pre preserving. We see the second commandment requires the receiving, observing, and keeping pure and entire. So this is, um, once we've discovered it, once we put it into uh, practice, uh, we've got to realize, well, the God wants us to keep it. Again, he doesn't want us to add or take away from it. He wants, he wants us to do it exactly as he says. It gives him joy to know as, the, as, as morally correct and um, all wise God. He knows exactly what it is that pleases him. He knows exactly what it is that's good for our souls. And so he wants it to be done. But then we do it, we must keep it pure and entire. We're not to take things away, because we think, well, you know, it's a little bit... Uh, well, the Roman church, for example, they thought it was a little bit too much uh, uh, to give the people the cup. They were from the 1215 in the Fourth Lateran Council. It was decided by the Roman Catholic Church that the people would no longer receive the cup. They'd just be given the bread as an element. So they withheld the cup. And how do they... St and they had... They had, uh, they had Thomas Aquinas come up with, with, with great reasoning why that was okay. But it was directly against the command of Christ. There's an example of taking it away. What about adding? Well, we could go straight back to Rome and consider all the things that they've added. But once we have it, once we've been reformed in our worship, there's a, a saying. So the church reformed, Ecclesia Reformata, then becomes the church reforming always reforming so if you don't know if you know that phrase so so um ecclesia reformata the church is reformed the reformed church semper reformanda if you know that last one is more common than the first always reforming always making why because we naturally by nature we deform all the time we bring things in we have different or even our, even if we go into a church uh, where everything is according to the word of God, if we do not sing the Psalms with grace in our heart, if our eyes are not pinned to the word of God, that we apply it in our lives, that we listen and we believe and we worship, but you can just sit in the pew and your worship is impure, idolatrous and unacceptable. So it's not just the reforming of the, of the, of the public worship, which is certainly needed, and to be kept pure, but the personal worship so always reforming, always endeavoring to be reformed by God's word as a, on the inside as well as on the outside, as a believer, as a congregation, reformed in faith and practice according to God's will, not according to man's tradition. And it's kept pure. Why? How? By keeping it entire. That's what it says, keeping it pure and entire. Deuteronomy 12 and verse 32 says, What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. And so we're not to ignore, we're not to sideline, we're not to emphasize any element of public worship than any other. And in being made zealous for God's house and for his worship, we are then demand, commanded in the Bible to be zealous for his pure worship. Psalm 16 and verse 4, which is what we read. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. And then, late, and then in Deuteronomy 7 verse 5, it says, But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. Which is why since the Protestant Reformation, the uh, true belief Protestant church, has always been against the false worship of Rome and the false gospel of Rome and any other false gospel. You just come into the United States and you just see it's filled with false gospels and cults and sects and this, that and the other. Canada's not far behind. So God has always taken his worship and the way of access into his glorious presence very seriously. And so should we. Lest Christ's rebuke of the Pharisees be directed towards your soul, and which is this, Mark 7 and verse 9. He said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep, that ye may keep your own tradition. 
Oh, may the Lord impress that upon our hearts. Uh, whether we're in our personal time of worship, a family worship or public worship, um, is this the command of God? So question 50 says, what is required in the second commandment? And the answer is, the second commandment requireth the receiving, serving, and keeping pure and entire all such religious worship and ordinances as God hath appointed in his word. Are there any questions at all? I'm sure there are thousands swimming around their head. Does that mean this? And does that? But we'll work through the second commandment, and, and God willing, we'll look at other aspects of the public worship of our God. Sure, that's the desire of every Christian to, I want to worship him. How does he want to be worshipped? So no questions. Well, we'll close in a word of prayer and then have a short time before the main um, public worship. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, our Creator and our Lawgiver and our Saviour, Redeemer, Thou who art holy and righteous, Thou who art merciful and gracious and long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, unto Thee, O God, our Lord, we, we bring our prayers of thanksgiving for Thy Word, and Lord, that Thou hast not abandoned us to all forms of foolishness and idolatry, but has made it clear. And Lord, we do pray that that will enable us, not only in the uh, coming few weeks of looking at the second commandment and seeing other aspects in the third commandment of thine own name and titles and attributes and works and word, but also in the fourth commandment of thy day to keep it holy uh, and keeping all the other commandments uh, which are to thy glory because against thee only have we sinned. And we do pray also in time thereafter that we would spend that time and to understand how and why thou wilt be worshipped. And so, Lord, bless thy word to our souls. And may it be added to us and to our sanctification, for thy word is a sanctifying word. And we pray this, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your time.